on it and certain key um, research. You said I've, I've, I've um, um, I know the one well, um, Bonnie. You, yeah. you do know it? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yes, yes, absolutely. Um, it's getting a little old now in a way, but it's still, I, would, I mean, I would urge people to see it, um, to understand a certain aspects of it. Certainly tomography is described in it, discussed in it um, quite a bit. And I have a feeling the fellow who is in that film is the one who um, you were referring to, Joy, with tactics. Probably. Like, okay, don't want to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm done. <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh, what am I doing? Yeah, that was in the very early stages, and so I don't think that they knew uh, the toys they were playing with at the time. Um, Bonnie, quickly, um, on the California Skywatch site where you have your um, Bonfire Coalition, you mentioned kindling, and I was, um, could you explain what the kindling part of the Bonfire Coalition is? Well, the thought was that when we're talking about um, how do we build this fire, this bonfire? And the, the idea of, of a bonfire um, as being a communal or a community event and usually to raise energy, I, I think possibly historically, maybe in ancient times, I don't know what they were doing exactly, but uh, the idea, I think of it as a circle of humans standing around a fire and that the kindling is any of the actions that any of us take to build this fire. And not only, but you could say that, you know, a fire of, of communication, um, and sort of like smoke signals, <laughs> not that the atmosphere needs to be more smoke in it, but this communication um, among and between people. So kindling for me is that fuel, the little, the fuel, the small actions that we each can take that contribute to this larger, um, I guess I see fire in this instance as a good, wholesome, um, communal expression of, um, of, of what fierceness maybe nope don't say fierceness of um, just energy to to um, make these changes to correct and I, I mean I've been trying to correct things my whole life and sometimes I say you know Bond you're getting a little old for this why don't you just be attentive to what's happening and of course um, this idea of being a calm and conscious witness is where I am arriving, and I think for me that's part of my own spiritual or my, uh, let's say, soulful um, emergence from all of this horror. But um, at the same time, I am an activist, and anybody who wants to contrib contribute any kin kindling to the bonfire um, or wants to stand around it with us and maybe hold hands, and I don't know, sing <laughs> roast marshmallows, I don't know, uh, to try to get these ideas out more broadly and... Um, and, you know, there's so much suffering. This is the other thing that makes me so angry. There is so much suffering. And when uh, you begin to get hip to Lyme disease as being a result of entomological warfare and you start researching that, which I have been, and uh, it, it, you just feel like this suffering that you see around you all the time. So many people here are so sick with these non result of non-lethal weaponry, which was this whole big exciting thing that came out of the military after World War II. You know, you can incapacitate your so-called enemy, but we didn't know we were all going to be the enemy. Anyway, I just get very um, fierce and fiery about the suffering. People are suffering so much they can't comprehend the enormity of what you and I are talking about right now. They can't even necessarily, especially with something like Lyme disease, you know, can't even clear their thoughts enough to get dinner together. So whether that's intentional or not, it seems like it might be. Um, oh, I just traveled all over the place again. So kindling would be actions and um, the way that we build the fire together. Does that help? Yes, it does help. Um, that's exactly the point that I was getting to. Ah, yes, an invitation to our listeners. Yes, yes. And also along those lines, um, I am looking at your website or the website for the Bonfire Coalition right now, and it says besides courage and a sense of humor, here's what we need. Volunteers, well-rounded with documentation and information, local and state organizers, letter or article writing, um, obtaining signatures on petitions, fundraising events, computer technicians, educators in our schools, um, media and press connections, photo and film archivists, 
documentary filmmakers, pro bono legal assistance, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> Air and water test results for elements, and those elements mainly would be heavy metals, I'm assuming. Or, or the ingredients that we know to be in, in the aerosols. Um, individuals to testify before the U.S. Congress, contact with local, state, and federal representatives, and researchers to find documents that will hold up in a court of law. So I just wanted to get that out for you, and you. hopefully we can get some volunteers in there. And we are at the top of the hour, and we're wondering if you can hang on with us there for a couple of minutes, Bonnie, while we do a station ID. Okay, sure. Okay, thank you. All right, you're listening to Freedom Slips, Revolution Radio. We're 100% listener supported. Uh, all our hosts volunteer their time, so if you could please hit the donate button and help us out with uh, the running of the station. Uh, we can continue to bring you news and issues that you won't hear on mainstream media. You're listening at the moment to Bonnie Hay from the Bonfire Coalition. They're associated with California Skywatch. Um, today, um, Nighthawk has put out an offer of the first uh, ten thirty dollar donators. Uh, we'll get a copy of the CD today. So, if you can do that, guys, it would be much appreciated. I don't need to tell the guys, you lot out there, how much this station does for uh, various different people. It all comes from their heart, and okay. we couldn't do it without you. And that free CD would be um, Michael Murphy's What in the World Are They Spraying, the documentary. So it, for then that will go to the first 10 donators of $30 or more. Okay. All right. I lost my place here. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I was wondering, um, Bonnie, if we could speak a little bit um, about the connecting the corporate dots. And I know that there's lots of key corporations that have been mentioned in the geoengineering, um, chemtrail, solar radiation, uh, that kind of thing. And what do you know about that? Well, um, I would urge you uh, to have Cindy Pakulis be your guest. Uh, because, oh. <laughs> oh, my gosh, she will rattle it off. Um, also, if people go to Long Island Skywatch, it really has been her realm of research. Um, I will tell you one uh, oh, that's fine. Il il illustrative um, story. Uh, my senator, one of my two senators for New York State is Kirsten Gillibrand, and when we began to discover what was happening with solar radiation management, we knew that the Congress in the House of Representatives was discussing solar radiation management and other geoengineering techniques. In fact, that was where we learned that we had a new word. We had a new term to work with. We weren't going to call them persistent jet contrails anymore. Now they were, oh, the same thing. Uh, you know, by any arose by any name. So I, um, along with some other people in the Bonfire Coalition, we put together packets of documentation about the dangers to agriculture. We're I live in a uh, quite an agricultural part of the world here, and um, a lot of actually a lot of. Um, uh, yes, organic farmers and community-supported agriculture and so on. So um, we took a nice little stack of documentation to her office and, uh, I'm sorry, emailed it to her, got it to her office, and then called both the Washington, D.C. and the Albany, New York offices to speak with somebody on the ag staff because she, this, uh, Senator Gillibrand, she actually serves on the Senate's Committee for Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry. And I never had a conversation, noted anyone else, had a, never had a conversation with anybody from either of her offices, either in Washington, D.C., nor in Albany, New York. Finally, after about a month, and I did my follow-up calls. You know, I know how to be an unpaid lobbyist. So I did my, my follow-up calls and all of that and could not seem to have a conversation with anybody about the loss of direct sunlight, which you would think would be a rather large issue for agriculture. Gosh, um, you know, a photosynthesis. You would think more people would notice, you know. Yes, this could be a problem. Uh, common <laughs> sense, second grade science here. <laughs> right. Um, but what happened was um, I finally got a phone call from an intern, yes, I'd been relegated, 
in Albany saying, oh, would you send that information again? And I thought, oh, shit. So I sent it and called in a couple of days doing my follow-up calls. Nothing. I never had a conversation with anybody in Gillibrand's office. It just was <laughs> astounding. You know what we found out thanks to Cindy's research? Her husband and her father-in-law are both very high up in British aerospace, large ah. global producer of military aircraft and of chaff. Wow. Put that together. So there's a connect the dots and from my own experience. Well, here's a little connect the dots that, that you can uh, share <laughs> as you see fit. But um, we all know Evergreen Aviation has been... Oh, yeah. Uh, has been named, and there is a headquarters, and some of our listeners listeners have heard me tell this story before, so I'll be brief, <laughs> but um, their, their headquarters is located in McMinnville, Oregon, or one of them is, and um, I happen to be living now very close to that, actually within 10 miles of that, but when I came back from my trip, which was a couple of months ago, um, I am now staying with my daughter, and I was horrified to figure out that a large majority of the agricultural land that is in our, our Oregon Valley surrounding the McMinnville area um, is owned and operated by, guess who? Evergreen Aviation. You know, and during a time when a lot of the people um, up here, uh, organic gardeners, people doing home gardens, had noticed when they planted their gardens like they normally do at the normal time of year, their stuff was barely coming up and then it would die and, and it would get moldy. And most people had to replant their gardens. Um, another issue up here, and that will just give you some kind of idea of what we've been dealing with, you know, mm-hmm. trying to grow things up in Oregon because we've been getting hammered up here on an on, on almost daily basis. For the first time in the history of this event, um, the city of Portland, Oregon is known um, as the City of Roses, and they do a rose festival around Memorial Day every year. And for the first time in the history of this event, there was not one rose in bloom for the Rose Festival. It was sad, you know, and that's the extent of what we've been dealing with. I mean, that tells that right there tells you a lot about the amount of sunlight that has been allowed to get to us, you know, in Oregon. Mm-hmm. But along those lines, you look at the Evergreen Aviation's um, owned agricultural land out here, and surprisingly, or not so surprisingly, Um, they're about the only ones that are doing really well and haven't had to till their crops back under and start over within the first few weeks of planting. So, 